our approach, brothers and sisters, is to break the subject down into five sections. In our first class, we want to consider the historical background. Before the foundation was even laid to the temple, the returning Israelites came from Babylon. We want to look at a little bit of that history. In our second session, we want to consider the trials that they experienced as they begin to build and the lessons that we can take from the trials that, that they went through. Then in our third class, we're going to look at what happens when they start using excuses. What happens when faithful men and women use excuses in the truth? And we'll look at that. In our fourth class, God willing, we're going to consider the message of encouragement that comes from Yahweh, that gets the people moving again. And then finally, in the fifth class, in our fifth session, we want to look at, as we said, what can we learn from these men of leadership qualities, but more importantly, we want to look at the man who God has chosen. So, as we mentioned earlier, to really understand this book, we want to look at Ezra. It's Ezra that's going to provide the background for the book of Haggai. So here we go with some of our dates. So as a refresher, it was the Babylonians that dragged the people of Judah into captivity, separating them from the land, destroying the temple in Jerusalem in the process. And it will not be until the time of the Persians that the way will finally be open for those displaced Jews to be able to return to the land of Israel. And I find it helpful to look at a chart like this because it kind of sets up the picture and it puts into perspective the different dates. So I like to look at it in waves. So you've got this idea of this first wave in the time of Haggai, Zerubbabel, and Joshua, the high priest. And that's in 538 BC. So a first wave of these Jews returning back to lay the foundation for the temple. And then we have what's called the second wave in the time of Ezra. And you notice there's about a 57-year gap there before the second wave when Ezra comes along. And that's around in 458 B.C. And you can see some of the different character names we've put at the bottom here. And then there's about another 12-year gap, and that's the third wave that comes back in the days of Nehemiah. And that's 444 B.C. But you notice, first of all, that the temple was built in the first wave. And I find that very significant because that was done before the walls were built, before the fortifications that Nehemiah came along and built. And I think the significance of that is that they put God first because we're going to find these are faithful men and women that came back to build. And so the first thing they did was put a place to worship God to conduct the sacrifices uh, with the temple. So that came first. So get that order right, and if we get it wrong, then we have troubles. And so they actually got it right. We're actually going to see they actually waited to a particular time, particular feast day, then to begin this. All right, here's our first eye chart. Well, let's stop for a moment, and we'll look at the big picture so we can get our bearings in the days of Haggai, in terms of biblical history. So on the left of the screen, we have headlined them as Judah, along here, that relate to them. And on the right side, we put things that relate to the Gentiles, to the Gentile kingdoms that are around them at that time. And in the center column, we've listed the key dates that relate to each of these sections of history. And it's, to be fair, they're not always agreed upon by historians, but still the, the dates are generally accepted. And we're going to find, again, because this book is so specifically dated, some of these dates are absolutely wonderful. Now, I realize, I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit uh, small to read, and again, if you would like a hand of that, we'd be happy to provide that for you. But one of the first key dates we'd like you to note on the screen here is 606. So if you see up at the top, there's 606 B.C. That's one of our first key dates. This is when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, takes Jehoiakim captive. 
And then you'll, in the blue over here, you'll see that was in the time, that was Nebuchadnezzar's first year in power. So that's one of the first dates we want to note in our Bible, 606 BC. Then we come down to 538 BC. And this is our next key time period. This is the year Cyrus overthrows Babylon and begins the Persian rule. And that, we'll, we'll see that's very significant. 536 BC is our next key date we want to note. And here is when Cyrus II decrees that the Jews can return to their own land. And we'll say about more of that in a moment. This is the time of Haggai. So Ezra chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us the foundation of the temple is laid around that particular time. So Zerubbabel, and here's a name we're going to get to know, also known as Sheshbazar, he's a descendant of David, and Joshua, who's the high priest, are the leaders. And as the faithful Israelites return to the land and begin to lay and rebuild the temple foundation, troubles start almost immediately. So the place is in ruins. The faithful Jews come back. Cyrus has allowed them to go back to build. And as soon as they start, they run into opposition. In 530, we notice that Cyrus is now off the scene. And several new kings take over. Finally, King Artaxerxes causes the work to stop in 522 BC. And again, details of that are contained in Ezra chapter 4. So that's where Ezra 4 fits in. So that happens in 530. Well, then the next date you'll see significant is 520 BC. 520 BC. This is where Haggai comes on. This is the first prophet after the exile, and he begins his message. And not only Haggai, it's also going to be Zechariah who's going to prophesy, and they're both going to begin their prophecies at this particular time in history. And they're going to motivate the people to build that temple, which is going to sit idle for a period of 15 years since it stopped. And they're going to try to get them fired up again because they came back with all good intentions and then they stopped and the temple sits idle for 15 years. What on earth happened? And then finally we see in 516 BC that the house of the Lord is finally finished. Now don't worry if you don't have all these dates. We're going to come back to this slide uh, once or twice as we go through. I wanted to just to give you a bit of an overview <clears throat> of the entire book of Haggai at a glance. So again, as we say, Haggai is very short prophecy. It's delivered over a period of approximately four months, covering a period altogether, really, of about 17 years, but even though it's delivered over four months. And as we said, Ezra provides the background, which is helpful to us for the record of Haggai. And for simplicity, I've summarized on the screen the entire events that take place in the book of Haggai. So we see that one of the key things, and probably what the book is best known for, is the title, Consider Your Ways. Right? Every time we hear, Consider Your Ways, we instantly think of the book of Haggai. That's what it's well known for. Well, what does Consider Your Ways mean? We're going we're gonna to look at that. So, here's these men and women of Judah, and they started strong. And so we find over here, that the work begins. And that's recorded for us in the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. So the work starts. But no sooner as it starts than what we call the woes begin. Because now you've got troubles. You've got opposition among the nations that are around them. And they're starting to oppose them. And that becomes the record of Ezra chapter 3. And then they don't just oppose them. They actually start to weaken the people, to stop them from doing their work. And that's in Ezra chapter 4. So the faithful are afraid, and the work begins to weaken. In Haggai 1 and verse 2, we actually find the work stops. And that's what that's about in Haggai 1 and verse 2, because eventually the work ground to a halt. So they were very successful. The opposition was very successful in getting them to stop. But 
The word of God's more powerful than that. And so in Haggai 1 and verse 14, we find that the work will begin again. The people need a real jolt to get them going. And what is that jolt? And then we see in Haggai 2 verse 3 that the work is actually then finally completed. Work on God's house is completed in approximately 516 BC. So that's the big picture of what we're seeing from Ezra to Haggai so we can kind of see the whole layout and the context uh, of the book. Well, since Haggai's message revolves so much around the building of the temple, in fact, so much of the book of Haggai is about the language of building, uh, we thought it helpful maybe to show the development of the temple uh, throughout history. Well, we know that the precursor of the temple in type and form was, of course, the tabernacle itself, built during the wilderness wanderings in approximately 1250 B.C. And, of course, later David envisions building a house for Yahweh, but he was unable to build, as we know, so he prepared the materials which Solomon, his son, would use to build the glorious temple in Jerusalem in approximately 968 B.C. And this magnificent building is the one that Haggai is going to reference in his book. So when he's asking them to reflect back, that's what he's telling them to reflect back on. You remember this temple? That's the one he's referring to, the one that Solomon built. The grandeur of Solomon's. Well, that we know that the Babylonians invaded the land. They ultimately destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. And what a devastation that must have been. And you think about the faithful Israelites on that one. They, they must have just absolutely devastated when, when that took place. Well, as the Babylonian Empire later then succumbs to the Persian Empire, favor is going to return to Israel, and the, may, the way then is going to be made open by the Persians for Israel to return to the land. And with the leadership and encouragement of Haggai, the temple is finally reconstructed by Zerubbabel from the ruins in about, as we say, 516, 515 B.C. So Zerubbabel's temple, that temple there, would last for 500 years. So then in the day of the Lord... Zerubbabel's temple would then see parts taken down, parts added, and a, and, a, and a lot of changes made to it, and that's what was done by Herod. So Herod would then take that, and he would build that magnificent structure that was at the time of the Lord, built from many of the parts from Zerubbabel's that we're reading about in the book of Haggai. And of course, we know that this temple, as prophesied by the Lord, would be destroyed. And it was, as we know, the Romans destroyed it in AD 70, and they leveled it to the ground. Well, to this day, religious Jews in the land of Israel are looking for the third temple. Have we heard of that, right? They're looking for the third temple. Well, the first one was Solomon's. The second temple, then, is Zerubbabel's slash Herod's. And then the third temple is one yet to come that they think the Messiah is going to set up. And, of course, we, too, wait for the setting up of the third temple after the design that we see in the book of Ezekiel. So the temple has always played a key part in Israel's history. In fact, you know, it's really interesting. Just this past summer, in, on July the 30th, there was an article in the Jerusalem Post, and the article was about the Jews today longing for this third temple. And the article talked about a celebration called Tisha B'Av. And this is an annual feast day in Judaism that's celebrated on August 6th and 7th. So they've just finished celebrating this. And this is where they remember a lot of the disasters that happened to them throughout history. Now you think that they would be remembering the Holocaust. Well, you know what they remember? They're remembering the destruction of their temple. So this is one of the primary things is this destruction of this temple by the Babylonian Empire 
and then also by the Roman Empire in Jerusalem. Now the article was interesting because it actually um, quotes Napoleon, who in his travels, he witnessed a celebration of Tisha B'Av by the Jews where they do this in August and they celebrate this. And he made this comment when he witnessed this celebration called Tisha B'Av. He said this, a nation that cries and fasts for over 2,000 years for their land and temple will surely be rewarded with both. So that's Napoleon's view of, the, of their remembrance of their temple. Well, the article goes on to say this, and this, now this is more commentary by the Jerusalem Post writer. The poignant scene Napoleon witnessed had been unfolding in Jewish cities and villages for more than 1,700 years. He was right to be impressed. We are people of memory and future. And historical consciousness can't be defeated by weapons or tongue. What would Napoleon say today if he saw Jews in modern Israel sitting on the floor and mourning that glory? He would probably shout, wake up and get off the ground. Hasn't your national glory been restored? Well, never mind Napoleon, brothers and sisters. I found that fascinating because Haggai is shouting to them. And he's shouting to us, consider your ways. That's the shout that's happening. Well, turn with me, please, to uh, Haggai 1 and verse 1. We see here in the first verse of Haggai 1 and verse 1, we see it's in the second year of Darius the king. It's in the sixth month. In the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, now, I find those words personally very sad. It's sad because it's no longer being dated by the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah. No, these are the times of Gentiles. This is dated by Gentile kings. Something dramatic has happened to Israel. The wickedness of Israel has manifested itself in their captivity under foreign governments. And the dominance by these foreign governments are going to plague Israel and last right down through history until the time of 1948. Well, how do we get to Darius and why is that important? Because he's mentioned in that verse. Well, we're assisted by a remarkable archaeological find. And it was discovered in the ancient city of Babylon, which, by the way, they said never existed in 1879 and today we can see this we know this as the cyrus cylinder and it's in the british museum and it was cyrus the second or cyrus the great who defeated the babylonians and so began the persian rule and the cyrus cylinder which written was written in approximately 538 bc they think almost exactly corresponding to the dates of Haggai's prophecy. Well, what we learn from the cylinder is that Cyrus's grand plan was to repatriate captive peoples back to their own homelands. And this was the decree that paved the way for the Jews to return to their land. Well, let's pick up these details in the biblical record. Turn with me, please, to 2 Chronicles 36, uh, and we'll read at verse 19. 2 Chronicles 36, beginning at verse 19, because... Here we're going to read of the Babylonians devastating of just destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, we are also now able to see how Chronicles fits in to the recordings of the times of Haggai and Zechariah and so on. So it's very interesting how all these different books of the Bible fit in around these times, or at least record events around these times. So verse 19, 2 Chronicles 36, we read, And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Verse 22, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up 
the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he make a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. That's an amazing statement. And he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all this people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. And so, eventually, we know, Cyrus goes off the scene. He's replaced by Darius I. He's going to come along later. He's going to ascend the Persian throne in about 522 BC. And this is the king of Haggai 1 and verse 1. And this is very significant. He's the one who eventually takes over. They go through a series of other kings, and he then blesses Israel as well. So this is kind of, you can see all these other kings. It gets very confusing parts of history. We'll try to go through those. We're really interested in Cyrus. We're really interested in Darius the first. And it's the Darius, that's the one we read in Haggai 1 and verse 1. As Cyrus paves the way, Darius is now going to finish that work that was started by Cyrus in allowing the Jews to build the temple. So Cyrus paved the way for the return of the Jews to the land, and Darius the first will provide much needed support to get the temple finished. But you think about it, who wants to go back? They've been living in exile in Babylon. Anybody know how long they've been in Babylon? According to Jeremiah? Anybody remember? I know you know. <laughs> Micah, how long? 70 years. So they've been there for 70 years. Well, who wants to go back after 70 years? They've probably assimilated. Some of their kids might have even married the, the, the people of the nation. Uh, they might have been jobs in government. They've got businesses going. Who wants to make the trek back to Jerusalem, even though the way has been made open for them to go back by Cyrus? And the distance from Babylon to Jerusalem is about 2,700 kilometers. I don't know how long it took Katie to get here, but I don't know, that, that's a, a distance like going from here to out west, isn't it? I mean, it's huge. And to, to go back by foot, it takes you about four months. We actually know that because Ezra tells us it took them four months. So four months to, to go back. Who wants to go back? Who wants to put on his sandals and, and get his hammer and go back and build, which they know this temple is in a mess. Well, out of all the millions or high hundreds of thousands that were taken into captivity, we're told in Ezra chapter 2, verse 64 and 65, there's 49,697 that put their hands up and said, yep, we'll go back, we'll build. 49,697. So I want us also, as we go through this study, to realize these were faithful brothers and sisters. They wanted to go back. They were prepared to do the journey. They put on their sandals, they got their hammers, and they were prepared to go back, and they were prepared to build. So something pricked their conscience. They had a conscience. They had a conscience toward God. They had a conscience toward the temple. And, and it's an, an amazing thing. We've had studies in this um, before about the idea of a conscience. Their conscience was pricked in Babylon. They responded to the word. It was instilled in them as it should be in us. And there was a saying that was given to me uh, when I was down in Barbados by a sister there, and she said this, she says, our conscience is God's warning system. Be very careful when it hurts you. Be very worried when it does not. And so they come back. Their, their conscience is pricked. They respond to that, and they come back. And it's Psalm 126 that I'll leave with you to look at. But Psalm 126, I think, lovely, is a beautiful psalm that details how they would have thought as they came back. It was almost like they were dreaming, it says in the Psalms, Psalm 126. It's like they were dreaming that they were able to come back uh, to the land. So I'll leave that with you at Psalm 126, verses 1 to 3. But one of the things that we want to get across is, what are the characteristics of these faithful uh, brothers and sisters that were coming back. Well, we know from the record in Ezra 3 that we had read, they had a very clear direction and purpose. That's one of the things we learn about faithful men and women. 
They have a very clear direction. They know where they're going. They were as one man, it says. They were not 49,697. They were as one man. They were very focused and resolute. That's one of the first things we learned. The other thing is we learn is they, that they're the type of people that put spiritual matters first and last. That's number one in their lives. And that comes through the record loud and clear. They waited until the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, we're going to see, to actually set up the temple. They were a, a, a group, first and last, spiritual matters. And thirdly, they had a willing spirit. You didn't have to ask those type of people twice. What can I do to help? And they were ready to pick up, and they were ready to go. So I think there's just a couple of really quick things there that can really help us to see the characters of faithful people. We get that from the record. The other thing is, as we go through our studies, and we'll come back to this, we're going to run into these characters of Haggai and Joshua and Zerubbabel and who they were, and we'll get to know them. Haggai, just for your uh, marginal notes, his name means festival. From Hag, feast or sacrifice. And then we've got, of course, Joshua, who's the high priest, and then we've got Zerubbabel, whose name means shoot of Babylon. So he was born in captivity. He's called the son of Sheltiel. And we'll, again, we'll look at that um, in a little bit more detail in our next class, God willing. Well, we find that the work begins. They heed the decree of Cyrus. The faithful of the people came back under the leadership of these men, Joshua, Zerubbabel, and Haggai, and they come back, and they come back to a charred mess. They come back to a temple that's in absolute ruin. And they're going to wait seven months before they get going. And they do that because they want to self celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the initial preparations begin. And again, Ezra is great because he records that for us. So we read here in Ezra 3, Then stood up Joshua, the son of Josedek, I'm reading from verse 2 of Ezra 3, and his brother and the priests and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brother, and builded the altar of the Lord, of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. First, foremost, put God first. Now in the second year of their coming out of the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Teal, son of Teal, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, Appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upwards to set forward the work of the house of God. Verse 10, and the builders laid the foundation of the Lord's house. And then you see in verse 11, at the very end, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So they're off to a great start. But something happens. Something happens to them. And what that is, we'll, we'll talk about, God willing, next week. But just a couple of really quick takeaways, hopefully, from our class this morning. First of all, only the eye of faith can see the hand of God actively at work in the kingdom of men, accomplishing both his purpose and providing for his people. And the faithful saw that, and they responded to it. Secondly, for a faith to be real, it must be accomplished, accompanied by action and a willing spirit. And that's what we need in the truth, brothers and sisters. And finally, faced with an overwhelming task, the faithful man or woman seeks to put God first. But the people, this faithful people, stopped. And we'll find out why, God willing, next week. Thank you.